Brother Tony's sermon, sermon, um, uh, sermon text is uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 22 through 25. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We were supposed to be speaking about ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God tonight, 1 Corinthians 4.1. But uh, first part of the week, the Lord told me that he didn't want me to present that. I had it prepared and everything. And so I don't like to get the short fuse on things. So I was a little bit anxious then. So I said, well, then I need to go back to the scriptures and find out what the... So tonight I, I, I realized that uh, after I heard Sister... Uh, Barb's test uh, opening, I realized why the Lord changed that on me. We're going to talk about Christ opened the door tonight. And so uh, I, it, it'll go good. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm always compelled to say this because I don't know why, but I want to say that, and, and I, I know I speak for every, every one of the brethren, but our purpose of getting up here, each one of us, and I know I can speak for all of us, is really to stir one another up. Do you know, somehow to, to bring a greater desire for God. That's, that's our purpose for getting up here. Yeah. And, and to create a, a heightened awareness of the conflict, you know, uh, that's about us. And, and, and so if, if we can see, that, see the conflict clearly, we can resolve the fight. And uh, we're, we're kindly disposed to one another in the spirit. But we can't forget this flesh that we carry about. And so we want to be ready to take the next position when it becomes available. You know, the world is out there ready to stir up the flesh every opportunity it gets. And Satan's going to see to that. So we're here to help one another and to, and, and to stir one another up and help prepare us for Christ. Now, you know, uh, there's a great difference between seeking for answers to questions, okay, we have about God and the kingdom of God, there's a great difference in that than rather seeking after God himself. Seeking after God because we have a desire to know him and to be familiar with his ways. Now, there's a, there's a great difference in just seeking after God because we desire him and just seeking after questions. Man does have the ability to do this, to follow after questions. He can look for answers. If God's given him the capacity to do that, he can do these things. We were made to be able to reason and to think, and that man was created, actually, to be able to do this, to think, so that he would seek after God. We know it was our sole responsibility, our sole objective is to seek after him. It's our response, every man's responsibility to do this. However, man can be turned uh, and in and, and seeking, he can, he can be turned to seek after the wrong things. And, uh, and so we can, uh, we can be just asking questions for questions' sakes. I've seen brethren, uh, uh, people do this. I've seen brethren. It's not wrong to ask questions and to seek after for answers, but men can be turned to seek uh, uh, after questions rather than God. Uh, questions for knowledge's sake, just to know the answers. Things like this is of the flesh, and, and we can throw these things down. Now, I'm making a point with this. We desire that our looking and our seeking be after the Lord. Yeah. All our questions be after the Lord. So we make sure that what's prompting us mm -hmm. is a desire to know him more, to know him better. Yeah. Kinds of questions. Well, what do you mean, questions? Well, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about doubt and, and questions of unbelief, and I'm not talking about questioning God and these kind of things. I'm just talking about a tendency to ask questions, unfruitful questions, endless questions. Oh, no, no. What about this and that? God does this because, and God does, he does not do this because. you know, got to have an answer for that. Men wanted to, almost like they were meddling in the, in the affairs of God, going into a place where they, they shouldn't be with all these questions. You know, the man who has to fill in all the blanks kind of thing, uh, it seems that people who do this, they, they fill every pothole in life. They, 
they, they subject themselves to every kind of mess that's out there, always out there asking questions. Now, while the man who desires God and runs after him, well, he can avoid a lot of these kind of things. You know, the, what the, the adversities that's out there, his faith and trust in God. Now, it's between him and the roughness of life out, and, 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 that's, and his desire to, uh, to have it all figured out, well, he, he can just throw this down and, and, and he, can, he can just trust in God and replace it with a desire for him. I say this because I want my desire for Jesus to fill in all those blanks that I might have along the way. Now, someone says, well, you know, that's naive and simple. But you, a lot of questions will be answered when we just accept that God is who he is. God is, it, 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 God has stated the case, and we just, he's exactly who he says he is, that he sits upon the circle of the earth, and there's no searching of his understanding. And it's God who asked the question, by the way. Hast thou not known question? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary, there is no searching of his understanding. We turn this question to the world, and we tell them, go find out what this means, and then come back. When you come to the very end of everything, when you get to the very end of everything, guess who you're going to find? God is there. That's who you'll find. He, and when you, uh, when you start at the very beginning, guess who's there? God is there. God's the beginning, and he's the end, and all in between there, it's God. The everlasting God, he wraps himself around and he cloaks himself around everything that he's created. See, God is the main thing is my point. What can we do to persuade our brethren of this, all these things I've just said, that God is the main point? It's a terrible weight on us to see, to see these kind of things take place that uh, our brother hasn't embraced this, this idea that God is the main thing. Would you get me some water, please? So that, so that they may desire to turn from the vain things and seek after God. We got so many of those and that profess the way of holiness. They've made such a mess out of just living, they can't even take hold of the kingdom of God. And it's, that's, a, that's a weight that we carry around. How do we convince them? That the way to manage this life is to seek after God and to figure out where God has placed him in the body of Christ and to get going. The words of Jesus come to my mind. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and those things shall be added to you. The greatest danger I could think of, one of the greatest dangers I could think of, is to be informed about the things of God and just not act upon them and respond to them. You, you know them, you got them in your head, but you don't respond to them. That's a great danger. I should never go into an area that has not meant for me to go where I shouldn't go. Thank you very much. There are many, there's a great many things we just simply do not know that I do not know. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't, it shouldn't bother me to tell people when these things come up, we just don't know. We can just say that information is not available to us. That information is not available to me. That's a better, that's far better than speculating about something and making a big old mess. We can just say we don't know. God didn't tell us. You know, when the heathen hear and do not receive the message, we do more damage trying to come up with some way to convince them. You know, uh, and we can do this by going into a place where it's, we haven't been authorized to go, trying to give answers who simply don't have. Paul, can, Paul speaking to a Corinth in his second letter, he told them, we do not attempt to stretch ourselves into places which is beyond the measure that we've been given. Yeah, right. There's been a measure that's been given in general to all the saints. And within that measure, that's, there's, it's been given to each one uh, a certain measure within that. And, and we ought not go beyond that. The world keeps asking and asking and asking, hey, can you answer me this? And, okay, then can you answer me that? Let's not forget in all of this that those who receive the gospel as a word of God, when they hear it, God is pleased to give them faith by which they believe and receive the Holy Spirit and inherit the promises of God in Christ Jesus. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 20, 20 21. Now, the idea that men have been free to go about 
and free to decide what they want to do in regards to God. Uh, this is just about a crazy thing to me. There's never been a time when man has been left up to, 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 to ask a bunch of questions and to figure it out for himself. God has never left it up to men to do, to do what, he, what he intended to do. There's never been a time when God was not involved in the affairs of men. In, in, in terms of managing his purpose, men have never been free. There's, there's never been a time when men was like a free moral agent, like they say. They never had free will. He never has had it. Master of their own destiny and a captain of their fate. This is not true. This is all an imagination. Men are not free, and they never have been. God has shut men up under condemnation. And he did this the very moment they transgressed and rebelled. God did this. He gave them a law in the very beginning. He gave them a commandment. After Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit of the tree, it was then immediately they were put under a curse. Shut up. Actually, we know, we learn, that all of creation, everything God created, was shut up under a curse. The serpent, the devil, Adam and Eve, all mankind, all creation, everything that God created has been reeling from that incident ever since. God shut men up to death right there on the spot, which is something God told Adam he was going to do. He told Adam, the day you eat, you would die. He didn't say, if you eat. He said, for in the day that thou eatest thereof. In those days, God didn't reveal much to men. He just, just kind of like told Adam and Eve, and he didn't go into a lot of specifics about it. Men were just not ready to hear too much then. They were not able to receive. Even Abraham, God didn't go into a lot of specifics with him. There was great periods of time. He just gave him vague and general outlines of what he was going to do. There's great periods of time that God did not... Uh, reveal a lot to Abraham and men like that. Just because God was quiet, though, doesn't mean that he had, he had withdrawn himself. God was very active in what he was, go was doing. Matter of fact, God was setting the stage, yeah. getting ready to define actually what was going on. He, God was getting ready to define uh, the curse and, uh, and sin and death. He was setting the stage so he could do this. He had to get men in position. And it took some time to do this. Yeah, right. uh, actually, you know, we know what the holdup was. Men were the holdup. God had to get men up to pace. Yeah. Actually, God said men uh, uh, were, was worse than anything. One time he said a, 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 a mule and a donkey knows his master, knows his crib, but men do not. So you know right then that what God had to, had to deal with, uh -huh. with men. So he had to get men up to speed. The curse of the earth. Now, men had already learned uh, early on that everything they did was against him. That it was rough, just like God said it was going to be. That they actually did sweat when they worked and toiled. But God wanted to teach men. Uh, he, wanted to, he wanted to bring this, he really wanted to bring this curse home to men. He wanted to teach them, many, among many other things, God wanted to teach men about sin and death what sin was really about, what, what it really meant, and what kind of death men had died. He needed to teach them this. God had a special way of doing this. We read it in our text tonight. Sarah did. He had a special way of teaching about these things because when the schoolmaster came, all of mankind was automatically enrolled in the school of law. All men went to class, and the law became everybody's tutor each and every one. Now, all men were under it, every one of them. And the law, it didn't hesitate to smite men either when they disobeyed. For the law is the knowledge of sin. See, he, he brought that knowledge to men. Schoolmaster, we know that whatsoever the law says, it says to all those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty before God. It's not like men weren't guilty before then, before the law came, because they were. But men had to be taught, and he learned, had to learn how to associate guilt with sin and, and the impossibilities, the impossibilities of men changing that condition that they were in. 
Now the law is bringing men's sins before them. And it brings all men before the judgment seat of God. Now, we have to tell the world, it's up to us, we have to tell the world what the law says before men can hear what Jesus says because uh, they they got to listen up. The law has something to say, and they've got to hear it before they can hear anything else. Every generation has to hear these things, that men are condemned before God. And the law is our testimony. See, the law will back us up that he'll testify to this. Wickedness abounds, and evil runs rampant when preachers don't tell men that God is angry with the wicked every day. He judges the righteous, and he's angry with the wicked. And the real point I wanted to show just quickly who the wicked are. There is none good, not none. Outside of Christ Jesus, all men are wicked. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Men got to hear this. They do. The blessing of God is not found in good behavior. We know this. You know this, brethren. They're found in Christ Jesus. It's selfish and wicked to reject God's provision for salvation. You see, there's and it's and contrary to what we hear today, God is angry about this. Yes, he is. Those without Christ Jesus. Now look about you and answer this question. Are they miserable and unsatisfied? Are they weary, troubled with every care? You bet they are. Do they live in solitude and loneliness without Christ? Yes, they do. It doesn't really matter what station a man is in. He's without Christ Jesus, that he doesn't have anything. He has no peace and comfort of soul who has not bowed the knee to the Lord. That's the way it was intended to be. They have no rest who has not given their absolute all to Christ. Now, we're talking about those who have not submitted to the Lord, to Christ Jesus, to the purpose of God. God's got a purpose. And those who have not submitted to him, that's who we're talking about. There are millions who profess Christ Jesus, but have not submitted to him, really. They, they, they've marched down the aisles. They've been baptized into Christ to walk in newness of life, but instead they've continued to walk after the world. This is a wicked thing they've done, certainly. God's not pleased, you see. I'm here to remind everyone tonight, if you've done this, if you've done it, God is angry with you. Now, we're not talking about a system of religious truths and stuff like that. We don't talk about that here, okay? We don't talk about, we, we're, talking about, we're talking about the things that God has said. These things apply to everyone. It doesn't matter what group you belong to, okay? It doesn't belong to, if you belong to the Restoration Movement. If, it, it doesn't matter if you belong to the Word of Truth Fellowship in Joplin, Missouri, see? If you don't genuinely belong to Christ, you don't have fellowship with the Spirit of God because God has shut up all men in condemnation under the law, which is administration of condemnation. And all men, every last one, is currently in this place if God, if Christ Jesus has not set them free. If a man has not come to the Lord, he is in a place of sin and trespasses, a place of deadness before God. That's a place where you can't find God. You can't hear him. You can't see him. And you can't know him. It's, a, it's really a spiritual condition. And the fact that we cannot see God physically confirms this is a spiritual reality. No man has seen God. No man can tolerate God and live. As we said earlier, there's no searching of his understanding. So that means that no man can search out God. This is way beyond a man's capacity. The way to God is beyond what men can do. Men can't do this. They can't get there. God must make himself known he's done this in Christ Jesus. And this is what preachers should be preaching. God has come in Christ Jesus. God has been revealing himself all along, little bit by little bit in increments. It's over time as men could take it. We have a God who communicates with us, brethren. God, our God has communicated with this world. He's actually reached out to us. Money and things, they make, they make a most miserable God. They do. They add to our grief and anxiety. And money and things have no consciousness. They cannot communicate to us. 
but the God of creation. Our God is full of goodness and truth. Amen. And he has been his desire to bless men. And he's made men so they can taste of the heavenly things, the spiritual things, things that do not exist in this realm. I've talked about things like peace and joy and love, things like this. Jesus said, I have come to preach deliverance to the captives. Yeah what he preached in the synagogue that day. And it doesn't take much study to find out that Jesus came preaching to all men. Uh -huh. yeah. Tells me all men were captives. Uh -huh. yeah. That's how Jesus could say, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Because it applies to all men. Jesus came preaching to all men. This is God's declaration of independence. The right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness can be found in no other than Christ Jesus. Yeah. It's, and it's only when you enter in to the kingdom of God that you can come to know, truly come to know life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness yeah, right. and joy. Mm -hmm. Men just bat these ideas around, yeah. really. But Christ, he gives them in truth Amen. to a man. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. It was the law that said... Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. The law says, you must obey me in all things. Yeah. I know nothing of repentance. I know nothing concerning genuine effort, sincere effort. Just do these things and thou shalt live. The law says, you must comply perfect obedience, yeah. continuing obedience in all these things. These, these are the only terms I can offer you. This is the law. Amen. If we go to the judgment, brethren, if we go to the judgment and the Lord says, I do not know you, then you're under this curse. Yeah. And this is the law. This is being shut up, okay, where, we, where escape is not possible. It is the law that kept men pinned down in sin and kept them guilty before God. And it's in this way that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us, the, the idea is to deliver us to Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. This was said to those in whom the law had completed a work in, you see. He said to those who were ready. These were said to those who were ready to be handed over to Christ. Those who have been laboring under a heavy burden of, of, uh, of trying to do it themselves. They're ready for justification by faith in Christ Jesus. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That the promise, the promise of life. It was a, the Apostle John says, and this is a confirmation that we seek. In Christ Jesus, that we have indeed passed from death yeah. into life. Amen. I don't know why I'm so dry tonight. Excuse me, though. It says here that the law kept men until the time of faith mm -hmm. in prison. This is the message that Paul and Barnabas returned with that God had swung the door of faith wide open. They were astounded. For he has granted repentance to the Gentiles by faith in Christ Jesus, they said. Yeah. When Peter came up to Jerusalem after the conversion of Cornelius, the Jews strongly disagreed with Peter, to say the least, for going in and eating with the uncircumcision. But after Peter carefully recounted all the events, and he preached Christ, and they were baptized, and how they received the Holy Spirit, just as we did in the beginning. They glorified God and said, God hath granted repentance to the Gentiles. Amen. What they said was, faith had come, Amen. you see. Right. They had been, the door of faith had wide. Now faith has come. Let us consider how marvelous this is. Think about it a minute. How precious is faith to one who's been shut up under the law? Someone who's been trying to make it on their own. How precious is faith? Well, it's the only way to get out from under the law. It's the only way to satisfy God. God is a righteous God. It's the only way to escape condemnation. It's so precious, faith is, that God's got to give it. It comes straight from him. Called the spirit of faith. We having the same spirit we speak. 
It was by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith that Paul asked, did you, how did you get the Spirit? It was the same chapter, that same chapter. We don't get anything from God without faith. Now, you know, there's a lot of debate about what faith means in the Bible and, and, and all kind of stuff like this. And it's a little bit unfortunate. They, we, got this, we, got, we got just the one word, and, and, uh, and it, it, it can mean many things. But the, but the, the kind of faith we're talking about, brethren, is, is, um, uh, is a way of life. It's the way we live. This, that's what we're talking about when we talk about faith. And as far as I'm concerned, that's generally what the Bible, that's what the, that's what our brethren are talking about in the scriptures when they're talking about living by faith. It's a way of life. It's it's really faith. It's it's how we live. It concerns things. It, it concerns such things as how we think, and then how we behave, where we go, and how we talk. That's that's living by faith. Living under God. That's that's living by faith. And a, a life that is lived by faith in the Son of God. You know, Paul, he said it the best, though. He said, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So he was talking about how he lived and how he thought and how he behaved, where he went, where he didn't go. He, this is faith. Without faith, it's impossible. It's impossible to give ourselves to God without faith. We need that access to God that faith provides. Living before God in Christ is a spiritual thing, isn't it? And it cannot be done apart from faith. If the decisions that men make in life and the manner in which they live, if they're not done in God, if they're not done in regard to uh, unseen realities, well, they're not, they have not been rendered to Christ Jesus. And men should be just told. That what they're doing by routine and habit, and they've been conditioned to do it, these things won't please God. They just have to be told. If that's if 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 they're doing it out of these kind of things, that God can't receive that. There's only really, and you know, I know it's elementary to speak this way to you, brethren, uh, but we go through these things, that, you know, the, the outline them in our minds. But there's only two possible ways to live, and, and I know you know this. Uh, we can live according to the world that we see. We can react to the things that we see, and, and that can be our motive and drive in life. Or we can live according to the spiritual things, the unseen realities. That, that's only two possibilities that we have. But faith now, see, God gives to faith, which makes living after the unseen things a, a, a possibility. It, it makes it a, actually makes it a reality that we can experience by faith. We really do partake of the things of God. We really do. We really do have real hope. Yeah. It is a real hope. We really do get the love of God. Not that he loves us, but that we love him back. Yeah. We really do get that, and we have a love for the brethren. Yeah. We really do get peace. God really does give peace, yeah. and he gives us joy, and many, many other things. These are realities, and they, and they come through by faith. These come from the Spirit of God, and they're the real McCoy. They're the real things. All you get from the all you get from the world is like cheap imitations and substitutes. They're the artificial things that Satan is able to conjure up, much like the wise men in Egypt. Yeah. Seek after those things. That's our that's our word. That's the only way to live that is pleasing to God. It's to seek those things that only the Spirit can give. Faith enables a man to partake of the heavenly things. It allows us a taste, actually taste, the, of, the, of the spiritual things of God. It's by faith we walk, and our walk is not after the manner of this world, for we walk at the, after the Spirit. It's by faith that we overcome the devil. Faith allows us to do this. We can cast down vain imaginations. Faith does this. By faith we extinguish fiery darts and subdue the enemy. We throw down and overthrow strongholds that we come up against us. We try to move in an area we can't get there. Faith will allow you to make progress in these places. It may, you may slow down, but you can, you can actually... When you come into a circumstance that's really... You can make it through the circumstance. How can you do this? Faith... We'll do this. Yeah. Now, tonight, I tried to draw your attention to two periods of time. I don't think I did that, but maybe I can do better here when, as I wrap this up. Uh, two states or conditions that men were in. Uh, it was like before faith. 
But after faith, they're like the but winds of Scripture, it occurred to me. You know, but winds of Scripture. It, uh, but when? Mm -hmm. You know, it, something changed. Um, but when the grace of our Lord appeared, said everything was completely different. You know, these, are, these are the but, but before and but after. They're, they're two different conditions. The circumstances are not the way they were. Amen. And the but after, you yeah. see, things have changed. In that period that the scripture calls but before, we could illustrate it this way. This is the way the but before was. We hire a lawyer to represent us at this time, the but before time, okay? He would describe our case as lost. He would review the facts, and he'd turn to you and say, we just don't have a leg to stand on. We will, have, we, we will just have to plead for mercy and leniency because we just don't have a case to present. Okay? The opening words of the trial lawyer on that day would sound like this. My honor, your honor, my client is guilty. We present ourselves before the court and we plead for mercy. This was but the but before. This is the situation. But then at but, after, but then we got the after faith came, yeah. you see. Well, this is when we got the mercy we needed. It is where the deliverance of God is clearly declared and made known. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, you know, it's kind of unfortunate that the Galatians were in such a state that Paul... <laughs> He couldn't speak to them about some things. I just have the, the, the feeling that uh, when, he, when he was speaking, when he was talking about uh, before and after, I could, I could just imagine that when his, he wanted to try to communicate this glorious truth that the door of faith had swung open. But see, the Galatians had, had been deceived and went back into the, uh, the before state. I can imagine Paul was very discouraged. He couldn't, like, launch into a, a great... Uh, 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 a series of insightful praises uh, concerning the work of redemption and, and, and the marvelous grace into which they've come. But see, he couldn't do this. Paul had a, he had a mess on his hands, and he, couldn't, he really couldn't share it with the brethren, this glorious truth which we find here, that Jesus has come to set the captives free. You see, there's really been no time, there's never been no time where men have not been attended to by God. There's divine management, you see. There's never been a time when God, when men was been just left alone. God has always been there managing men. Amen. Now, I think that the first time that the, the scriptures uh, call us children of God, which this is what Paul does in the 26th verse, for ye are all the children of God by faith. In Christ Jesus. I believe it was Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ himself who opened us up to that phrase. That we are the children of God. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. That's the first time that was used. And I thought it was, I thought it was a marvelous consideration now that we've been, we've been called out of, out of bondage and to freedom in Christ Jesus. Paul was saying here, children of God. We've been called and brought into the family of God as his dear children. That's a long way from being under the bondage of law. That's a long way from being under a curse. Mm -hmm. Brethren, I hope that uh, you have uh, been encouraged to consider this, uh, this truth tonight that God has, and it, did, it, 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 it really ministered to me to see uh, clearly again how God has... Uh, he actually provided for men. He, uh, he put them in a place for safekeeping, so to speak, under a law to teach them some sense. And then until Christ came and delivered them. Thank you.